Thank you very much for taking the time out to come to our first seminar in our second UWD DBWC Women and Leadership Seminar Series. And today we have with us a fantastic guest, someone whom I am truly privileged to introduce to you, Aisha Alkabi. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Aisha is such a multifaceted, phenomenal lady that it would be a great disadvantage if I would not to spend about 10 minutes just describing all that Aisha has done. So, let me start without further ado. Aisha received her MA in Developmental Biology and Tissue Culturing from the University of Arkansas, United States of America in 2001. She has conducted and published research on cell motility with both Dr. Paul Bell and Dr. Barbara Sefieshko at the University of Arkansas, USA. In addition, she has also worked as a co-researcher on tissue culturing with Dr. C. F. Bailey at the Developmental Biology Lab, University of Oklahoma, USA. Prior to her previous role as a researcher, Aisha was a teacher assistant at the Department of Biology at the UA University and Aisha has told me in my talk with her that she was the first Emirati teacher assistant and the youngest in the UAE. Yes. Since coming back from the USA, uh, Aisha chose a career change, one of many, and was appointed as Assistant Secretary General and the Head of UNESCO Department at the UAE National Commission for UNESCO, which was under the Ministry of Education for UAE. She had yet another career change and became a news presenter, transgressing gender boundaries, I would say, and we would, of course, try and go a little bit deeper into that in our narrative today and presented the local news Ulum Adar, yes, Ulum, Ulum Adar, as well as having a similar role at Dubai TV, which was hugely popular as a, as a TV presenter. Aisha left her broadcasting career and became media and publishing supervisor of Kalima, a huge translation project launched by Abu Dhabi Authority for Culture and Heritage, after which she de then joined Khalifa University to manage the Discovery Center with a group of young Emirati students. Aisha joined the UNDP in September 2013 as a democratic governance analyst and soon became the head of program unit. She is currently both the gender and youth focal point at UAE office and does a lot of work with Emirati young men and women in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship particularly. During her career, Aisha has attended many training programs. She was the first woman to be chosen by the UAE government for spokesperson empowerment course managing crisis at Abu Dhabi Media Company. Adding to Aisha's diverse background, she is a short story writer, she is a poet and artist, and she won the Emirati Women Award, Women Award in Literature and Art in 2011 for her book, No Consolation for House Cats. What a fascinating title. <laughs> she also did a solo art exhibition at the Abu Dhabi Art Hub to mark the 43rd UAE National Day. So a truly phenomenal woman to start our UOWD, DBWC, UNDP Women and Leadership Seminar Series. Thank you very much. Thank you. On this occasion, I am delighted to share with you that UNDP uh, Center in, uh, in Abu Dhabi has one of its mandates to ensure that they are working on the, uh, the uh, gender parity mandate of uh, the sustainable development goals and as part of that, under that umbrella, uh, they are now collaborating with UOWD and DBWC to be part of this women and leadership seminar series. So, that is another huge achievement and yeah. as we said, we are growing our network and we are moving from pleasure. strength to strength. So, thank you so much for that. Thank you. So, without further ado, let us start our interview for today. Now, our interviews are essentially personal narratives. We do a lot of work now being, being an academic and being somebody who has been in the area of strategic change and women in leadership. There is a lot of rhetoric, there is a lot of work around the strategic deliverables when it comes to, uh, you know, essentially creating a more inclusive environments. But what we are going to do today is uh, a human life interest story. It's a, it's a personal narrative of how Aisha has navigated uh, 
around the various challenges and opportunities to emerge as a, a leader in her personal and professional life. Now, motility is the area of your research, Aisha. Yes. Which I, which I discovered is a, a synonym for locomotion. And the definition is the ability to move spontaneously and actively, consuming energy in the process. Motility is genetically determined, but may be influenced by environmental factors. My question to you, Aisha, is would you say that your life personifies this description of motility? Uh, I would like first to welcome everybody here and thank them in person, each and everyone, for taking the time to come and listen to, uh, to me. Uh, you, s you made me sound like you know, I did many things, but uh, I think I was just trying to discover myself here and there and pieces of what I, I like to be accomplished. And uh, to go back to your question, uh, to be honest, when you said motility, I was kind of surprised. Oh, that! I, I, I actually pictured myself as one of those cells that I was, you know, watching under the microscope. Am I like that? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I don't like to be put in a template. I don't like to. I don't like boundaries. I like to be free. I like to be given all the chance and all the space that I would, uh, that I can have, that I can have in order to. So you said that leadership is about constantly asking yourself why not yeah. and not be de defined by preconceived expectations and moves. Are you able to share with us something about the journey through life, your early experiences as an Al-Kabi woman yeah. growing up? In, uh, well, le let me give you a remark here. I just noticed that my husband and my colleague here uh, who just came from Italy are the only men <laughs> <laughs> uh, except, uh, of course, for some uh, of the staff here who are working. But mostly, I think uh, those who got interested in attending this uh, seminar with uh, ladies, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So, good for you. Go, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, and most of them are not Emirati. I can see a few uh, ladies from Emirati, but uh, uh, I can see that there is a curiosity of uh, discovering the Emirati women and how do we get uh, to break our boundaries and uh, uh, achieve our goals and become the leaders that we want to be? So I can understand that. And let me today try to give you uh, uh, a flashback on my, my childhood. The lady who is standing here beside you, putting her makeup in the best shape she could be, actually was just a little girl who, uh, who were going, you know, with her aunt. Uh, after the sheep to make sure that the sheep and the goats eats very well. I came from a very um, uh, agricultural place in the, in the mid of the Emirates actually. They used to call it Al-Mantaq Al-Wusta, the middle area uh, in Ajman. I was born actually in Al Ain, but I was raised in Ajman uh, in a place called Al Manama, a village, a very small village where most of the people there are farmers and my father was a farmer and I think this is something I should be proud of. Uh, I really, I really had, uh, you know, the benefit and the advantage of, you know, going with my aunt on those long early walks in the morning behind the goats and listening to all her stories, listening to all, you know, the, her wisdom. Uh, Telling me all about the, you know our history and our her background and everything, so I really treasure that. I really treasure these moments. They made me what I am. If I'm a good uh, short story writer, that's because my aunt she used to tell me all these stories, and I guess that developed the you know the passion in building stories in me. So that's 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 the side that. Um, uh, that actually brought up the, the storyteller in me. But uh, as a leader, I was really blessed with a father who used to tell me, you're no less than any man. When I was little, you know, in, in a tribe like our tribe, al kabi uh, most of the ladies or most of the women, most actually of my sisters, got married when they are, some of them, one, one of them actually was uh, 14 when she got married. And some of them were getting married. My mother got married when she was 13. 
and uh, usually in uh, you know environments where uh, most of the people are farmers you know especially in the Arab region they get uh, more than one wife so uh, the more you, children you have it's better for the farm they will help you and that's what we did actually we will go to the farm in the harvest uh, season and we will harvest with my father the tomatoes onions, stuff. so we were helpers we were neighbors in a kind of way uh, so um, my father used to tell me uh, we used to have you know many VIPs coming and visiting one of them was Sheikh Hamid Bar Rashid uh, my father used to be a friend of uh, his father and he used to come and visit and every time you know instead of uh, calling my brothers to come and sit with him my father used to call me he would say come Aisha uh, tell him what was the last uh, you know verses of Quran that that you could recite and I have a very good voice in reciting Quran in a very you know like uh, poetic way we call it tajweed so I was really mastering that when I was little and I he would you know people would clap at me the way I recite like Abdul Basit Abdul Samad or you know some of those you know very famous you know Quran reciters or something so uh, and I would feel proud and that was the first lesson that I got from my father. You're no less than any man. And when you talk to the men, don't make them feel that you are a woman and you're shy. And no, just speak. imagine yourself a man like them and speak your mind. Don't be ashamed of what you're thinking. Just say it. You know, I, I trust you. You know what's wrong and you know what's right. So don't be shy to say it. And that, you know, actually, you know, this, I carry this advice uh, with me in all my you know stages of my life uh, and I practiced it so from choosing research in biology at UA University that's where you went to yes. biology uh, to a master's degree in developmental biology and tissue culture it is quite apparent that you had a childhood where you were not restricted to gendered binaries where this is for men and this is for women and sometimes these messages can have very lasting negative impact there is some research to show that Although we so say that it is stereotypical notions that is preventing women into moving into higher level leadership positions, there is some later research that is showing that it is essentially due to lack of career capital that women are unable to build because early on in their childhood, they have sometimes grown up with messages that these domains are for men and these yeah. domains are for women so that when they enter into a career at a later stage, they are already coming up with lower self-efficacy and sometimes they drop out. But in your case, you got a fantastic opportunity to develop leadership capital early on with a father who told you that you are an equal and you were provided with opportunities for risk taking when you were brought in front of so many men and asked to recite and asked to essentially, you know, take some risks. So why, why biology? Why, why would you choose biology? And, and I think you were very interested in literature as well when you were a child. Yes. Actually, when I graduated from high school, I was, um, it was a hard decision for me to choose to study uh, biology or literature, to go for literature or to biology, uh, especially that in the family we have, my father was a poet and um, my uh, eldest sister is a novelist and she was actually the first woman who wrote uh, a novel uh, in UAE, Sara Al-Jarwan, if uh, you ever heard about her name. So uh, I love literature, but I thought to, I thought to myself that you know literature I could you know uh, I could fulfill this uh, this hunger to knowing about literature only by reading maybe or I could do it myself. But biology I have to go you know academic to to know this. I have to go to school. Uh, for me I love biology because. Uh, it was, you know, a food for my curiosity. I had all these questions about my body, my, uh, the living beings, and uh, uh, the biology was like the door that could give me all these answers to, mm -hmm. to my curiosity. But you were also the first woman to go to university in your home. So how did you convince the, there was also a social structure that you were part of. As I told you, Jay, I was a very hard worker since I was little, and maybe, Part of me actually liked the encouragement that I had from my parents when I did anything good. So if my father goes to school to pick me up and the teacher would tell him that, oh, you have a very bright girl, she's, 
she really has a nice voice and look at her paintings her paintings are really nice and if they and he would you know would be very very happy and would take me somewhere or give me presents or shower me with compliments i like that that encouragement i like the feeling to make him proud and make my mom proud so i thought you know i, I kept it this way i kept it this way i just i loved school i loved you know being you know uh, uh, always you know on the top uh, and i don't know it, it just so when would you say that you therefore opened the door for many women in your family to then start did that happen because yes. your father was also the head of the tribe and he had a lot of say in yes. you know my father always used to sleep like uh, around 9 o'clock he would wake up around uh, maybe 1 to 2 o'clock to pray we have uh, praying in the middle of the night this is if you want to get close to your god you want to pray by this time so he wakes up always at that time without any alarm or anything and he would see me studying and one day he told me in the morning uh, he used to call me i wish i wish if i didn't let you go to university i will be doing a very great sin you should go to university since i could see you you love you love education you love um, studying and you're a very bright girl you should go to the university and that was a decision that nobody in our place and our tribe by that time was even you know allowed to think of to send his daughter to al ain it was like a far away place and she has to live in a dorm she will not be you know staying uh, you know with them or going and coming back in the same day so it was a hard decision it was a very brave decision but he was like the head of his tribe so when people even our relatives do they know that he's sending his uh, his his he's sending her to the university and it's in al ain so they thought that th- then it's okay why not so after me alhamdulillah no no lady in our at least you know the close family uh, got, got married before going to the university so i was the first one and i'm really glad that i opened the door for the rest of them and then to us now yes how did that <laughs> yeah al ain is one thing us is yeah i graduated with merit Yes. Thanks to God from uh, Al Ain University, the uh, College of Science, and I was the youngest uh, Emirati teacher assistant uh, who was chosen to teach in uh, to teach biology. I was uh, actually many times mistaken with students. People will, will like security people will not allow me to go to meetings because they think that I'm a student. You know, telling them that I'm uh, <laughs> I'm a teacher, lying to them or something or joking. So uh, at that time, the, the University of Al Ain gave me the chance actually to study abroad to go and uh, proceed my uh, my study in uh, and take a master degree in biology. Mm-hmm. And by that time, my my father was um, like he passed away. Uh, he passed away like one term before I graduated. And uh, I actually talked with my brother, my. Uh, my the biggest one among them and i remember what he said exactly uh he said if you want if you want to go to the moon i would trust you and i was up and i this this sentence i i really uh, i hold his trust and her his trust in me very dear and i thought uh, i thought to myself that i will never disappoint my brother uh, i was so grateful and i went to the states i um, i got my master and actually uh uh i had to make uh, i have to take the exam for 12 uh subjects in one term and alhamdulillah i passed all of them mm-hmm. and uh, i guess i was just so there was less like god was on my side <laughs> what do you think guys <laughs> perseverance Yeah. So since coming back from the USA you chose a career change and you were appointed as assistant secretary general and the head of UN- UNESCO department yeah at the UAE National Commission uh, for UNESCO what was your motivation to join UNESCO you told me some really beautiful stories and i think uh, why why UNESCO why an organization such as UN 
Jay, I have many interests in my life. I have many aspects uh, in my personality that sometimes I need to discover myself. I always knew that I like to uh, represent my country. I like to take this image of Arab lady to the, to the rest of the world to show them that we're not that close to ourselves. We're not in a cocoon like people would think we are. And uh, that idea of you know uh, joining a very noble organization like the UNESCO was uh, really like achieving a dream. I, I, I just saw the ad in the newspaper mm -hmm. and I got fascinated. I said, I have to join the UNESCO. Why not? So exactly. Why not? All yes. about why not? Why not? Then and then I called, and you know what they say? They said, "Oh, actually, the ad was for a, a job, but not for the UNESCO office here in UAE. It was for the UNESCO uh, headquarter in Paris." And I called, but uh, unfortunately, they told me that the deadline was like uh, last week, and I said, "Oh, oh, I, I really wanted to." And uh, I was lucky also because on the other side of the phone was Dr. Awad Saleh. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, his name. He was the, uh, the Secretary General of UNESCO Commission here, uh, National Commission in UAE. And he said, you are in Marathi? I said, yes. And you want to work in UNESCO? I said, yeah, why not? Do you have uh, a good background in uh, international uh, organizations or something? I said, no, I just had my master's degree in biology. And he said, OK, science, good. Uh, do you have the language? He said, yes, I can speak very good English. OK, and Arabic? Yes, I can. OK, please send me your CV. <laughs> so I, I sent him his, my CV. And um, he actually uh, replied to me that if you would like to, uh, to come, we would like you to meet the Minister of Education. I was so lucky. And I said to myself, oh, those people are really <laughs> interested. <laughs> so I went there, and I, uh, I had a very good interview with the Minister of Education. And they said, Asha, you got the job. And I was so happy and so blessed. Uh, for like after coming back from uh, the state, I stayed home for two years looking for a good, uh, you know, um, a good job that would actually fulfill my my curiosity to doing uh, scientific research. But unfortunately, at that time when I came back, it was 2000, uh, 2001. At that time, there was no like uh, research, uh, scientific research in the UAE. Most of the jobs that I actually applied to were either uh, lab technician or uh, science teacher, stuff like that. That's, uh, that is the only thing that I could do. You are all overqualified. That's what everybody kept telling me. So that's why when I saw the ad about UNESCO, I just loved it and I went for it. And just 10 days into going to Paris, oh yeah, you went into another job. You had. You became a news presenter at Abu Dhabi TV. How did that happen? That's also because of an Just ad in a newspaper. <laughs> I mean, your passports were ready. You were yeah. about to go to Paris. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, you said. I'm a very adventurous by the name. Careers itself, uh, you know, are also divided into gender domains. What is yes. acceptable for men? What is acceptable for women? Particularly in traditional uh, cultures. And yeah. uh, the media was, was, was clearly not not the acceptable norm. Yes. It, it had, it is, it's still not normalized for Emirati women, I'm, I'm presuming, to be uh, in the media. So, yeah, how Not all of the families would yes. love for their daughters to work in the media. So how, how did that happen? How, well, how were maybe you? working in the media behind the scenes or behind the screens, that's OK. But to be a news anchor and go public, and everybody would know your fa face, would tag you for your name and your family. Uh, then uh, that's another story. T like I was blessed by the by this grant from uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed to be the UNESCO representative uh, for UAE and the headquarter in uh, in Paris. I was so lucky. I got my uh, diplomatic passport for uh, and uh, everything was ready. My apartment was ready there in Paris. And all of a sudden, I see this small ad in the newspaper that. They want local news anchors. And guess what? <laughs> the next day I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> and by that time, it was rare that you find any local lady who's working uh, as a news anchor, especially in Abu Dhabi. Maybe in Dubai, they started earlier than us. But in Abu Dhabi, it was really uh, because 
you know, as, as you know, maybe Dubai is more open to expats, and, uh, so, but Abu Dhabi is still kind of, uh, there are many tribes who are, um, people are conservative there, yeah. more conservative, and um, most of them are coming also, especially to tribes like uh, Al-Kaabi, most of them coming from al Ain and uh, very, you know, um, uh, conservative, uh, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyways, uh, by that time, uh, I, I said uh, I, I will just I will just uh, stop dreaming about being a news anchor and just go on with my UNESCO career and everything. And just a few days, like you said, before going to Paris, I saw this ad and I decided to join. And I knew that I had the charisma of being the news anchor. Uh, I have a good voice and my Arabic is really good mm -hmm. uh, and I thought I was very confident they gave me the um, I, w I went to the, uh, the camera test and they gave me the uh, like uh, an idea of a show or something they told me just come up with an idea of a show and I'm gonna be one of them said I'm gonna be your guest just you know you know shower me with the questions and in five minutes, I came up with a brilliant idea of a show. I gave it a title, and I prepared my questions. I was asking him like a very well-trained news anchor. And, and you know, after that, they said, uh, did you ever work in uh, the media? I said, no, that was my first time. And you know, the very next day, they called me, and they said, we would like you to come and to sign uh, your contract. I thought this is, uh, you it's know, it's, uh, it's like, you know, God is actually was uh, pointing me where to my path, where yeah, to be. where I wanted to be. It's, 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 it's really fascinating. Now, there is a very common theme that is coming in all that you're saying. Every opportunity, now, there were these stereotype threats, you know, there were these domains that others had not entered in, yeah. and you were essentially the first one, path breaking in many ways. And in, in, in many cases, since we are talking about women and leadership, women respond uh, with vulnerability responses, we call it, in yeah. academic language, where uh, because I feel uh, that I'm in a stereotyped environment, I feel more threatened and yeah. more vulnerable, and therefore uh, I then just step out rather than competing. Or there are other cases where when I feel threatened, I uh, engage in behaviors to counter, so for example, if I'm in a masculine environment where masculine yeah. responses are needed, then I become even more masculine that is necessary. Yes. Or, so, it, but in your case, it's, it's rather fascinating. It's neither vulnerable responses nor reactive responses, but perseverance born out of self-efficacy that, yes, why not? This is something that I can easily do. So, I'm going to take this as an opportunity yeah. and give it my best shot. I have to put on a mask. I was going to come to that. Yes. How did you explain? How, how did you establish your legitimacy as, yeah. in an environment like that? As I explained to you, that was the look that everybody actually was looking at. When I first joined, nobody knows you. Nobody had the chance to talk to you, you know, to study your mind. To, I had to pretend that, that I'm somebody else. I was so, so, so proud of myself. I had to stop everyone from thinking that uh, he could open a conversation without any. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I was actually trying to give him a message that I could be in this field and I, I'm going to be very good in my, in my uh, prof uh, professionalist and I'm going to be very good in my career. I will do very well. I will come on time. I will respect my job. I will respect all my colleagues. But I'm not the kind of girl that you're thinking I am. Mm -hmm. So I had to show them uh, that uh, the other side of Aisha, which is not my real personality, but I had to wear that mask mm -hmm. to make people, you know, um, respect you. So you ended up establishing certain rules and exactly you made sure that people understood what it, you stand for. Exactly. But there is, there is some evidence that women uh, often, and it's related to what you're saying, that women yeah. often experience a double bind at the workplace. Uh, so uh, if you are very competent and if you're assertive, yes. then you're not nice enough. Yes, they will think that you're rude. You, you know, we have terminologies like, such as she's very bossy, for example, yes. which, which comes from those kind of assumptions. But if you're too nice, then you're not competent enough. 
So, in your case, you seem to have navigated the boundaries quite well to balance uh, between, you know, fear and respect. Yes. Uh, to be honest, Jay, uh, uh, let me tell you something about the uh, environment here, uh, the work environment. Uh, I, I worked in many places and I have this uh, uh, piece of information that I would like to share with my friends here that people here do not uh, separate the work relationship from the personal relationship. Like, I could give you an advice, or uh, as as uh, as as a boss, I would give one of my uh, the one of the people who are working in my team uh, a remark or something. It could be a harsh remark, mm -hmm. but it's for the benefit of the work. Mm -hmm. The next day, even if I call her, you know, after the, and she wouldn't talk to me. Mm -hmm. She would think that uh, either you be nice to me all the time, and you treat me like a friend in the you know at work and outside or you're not my friend. Mm -hmm. They think that uh, they cannot really uh, differentiate between the re relationship work, uh, work relationship and uh, the, um, the personal relationship. Mm -hmm. So this is really uh, something that we as Arab need to work on, I guess. Mm -hmm. That it's okay as, a, as your boss to give you an advice, to give you a remark, but by the end of the day, we're still, we should be friends because that wouldn't affect our relationship. So how do you know it is time to exit? Because you did not stay in Abu Dhabi TV either for yeah. too long, although you yes. were extremely popular. You know, I just follow my heart. I just follow my heart and I trust God. And when it's time to leave, I just, I just feel it. Uh, I'm not the kind of person who would stay under any pressure. If there's something that I cannot accomplish, mm -hmm. uh, and um, if there is an environment that doesn't let me bloom, then I wouldn't stay in that environment. Once I feel that uh, staying in that place will not give me wings, then I should just, I just fly. I just leave it and fly, and I just trust God and follow my heart. So Aisha, it's possible that some of the people sitting here might think that you can do it because you have privilege. You are privileged. But I can't because I have to pay the rent and I have to look after my children. What advice would you give to people like that who are stuck in situations where they obviously have a lot of talent but they are not growing, but they are too fearful to leave, leave that space? No, to be, to be honest, I didn't have any privilege. Actually, I was, I'm just like any of you guys. I had, you know, like uh, loans for the banks. I had people, uh, you know, depending on me. Uh, I have kids. I have uh, other, you know, uh, like uh, financial responsibilities, like, any, like all of us, like any other person. But the thing that uh, I always believe that that God never closed one door without opening another one. I trust God. And since you're doing the right thing, and in your heart you know that you're doing the right thing, then don't be afraid to leave. My question to you is based on, now from what, what you're saying, it appears to me that you've always had a more expanded sense of self. Yourself, some of us, we get our validation from our professional identities. Or sometimes even our gender, you know, sometimes yeah. if we start associating ourselves too much with our gender identities or our professional identities, uh, every time that identity is threatened, we start probably reacting in ways that is unhelpful. In your case, you seem to have an inner core that does not shake very easily, no matter what the external circumstances are. And you seem to continuously start going inwards before I should save myself there. Yeah. I choose to save myself. What do you mean by that? Uh, many times in life, you find yourself uh, in a situation where you are cornered. Uh, everything is against you. You're trapped in a way. Yeah. And it's very easy sometimes to give up. It's easier actually than to 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 uh, to to fight fight back prove yourself again, to start from zero again in another place where nobody knows you, where nobody knows what you've already achieved. It's very hard. It's the, 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 actually, the, the easiest way would be just to go in that uh, uh, 
stage of uh, depression and start blaming people for not, you know, appreciating your talents or appreciating it. It's very easy to do that. But I choose to stay myself. I choose to struggle and even to start from uh, scratch, but not to give up. So the messages inside your head was, I will not give up. I will not. No matter up. what. Yeah. I will save myself. The message is no one is going to save me. I have to save myself. I just remember the latest uh, stage of my life where I felt that I was trapped. Um, uh, I have uh, always a um, uh, high-risk pregnancy and with all my four kids, alhamdulillah, who are doing very well, alhamdulillah, I had very tough pregnancy period. Lately, I had this uh, episode with my uh, with my fourth pregnancy that I got uh, poisoned by the placenta of the baby. Uh, they call it uh, preeclampsia. And this is a very rare thing that happens. You get poisoned by your own baby. And, uh, you know, I thought that, you know, after, you know, going into eight months of, you know, taking all your pills, uh, sleeping all day and night, and all the suffering that you guys, I'm sure you know about it. How being a pregnant lady is hard enough. Imagine if you are a high-risk pregnant lady and you have high blood pressure and you have edema in, all in your body and stuff like that. You are struggling. And, you know, you're thinking that you're going to meet your baby after the C-section and then that's going to be the end of your struggle. And all of a sudden, people are telling you that there is, there is a small thing about, uh, there is a small case about your leg that we don't know about your leg is start uh, start uh, uh, it's almost blowing like a balloon and one of my legs the, the right one and they didn't know what was going wrong with it and I stayed in the hospital and they thought that it was a blood clog or something and they told me that I have to take uh, you know aspirin because they thought that it's going to go away. They tried all different kinds of medications and nobody could tell me actually what was wrong with my, with my right leg. And uh, I was fortunate to go to uh, a pediatric who took a look at my foot. By that time, my foot, I was actually, uh, you know, like um, dragging my foot on the floor. I, I couldn't, I couldn't even walk, bare walking on it. And it was purple and that big. Like three times the size of my my left leg, and I the doctor just took a look at it and said, "What's wrong with what on earth is happening with your foot?" And I said, "They don't know. They say that it's a blood clot or something like that. Nobody's sure. I went to many many hospitals here, and nobody has the answer for me." And he said, "Wait, I will call a very good doctor, who is a radiologist. He's a doctor and he's a radiologist, and he's the one who's doing you know the um, he, he should." CT scan your skill now and uh, you know I just I was so tired my baby was sick and he's a pediatric for God's sake how would he know <laughs> what's going on and I said I said no I'm very sick and very tired and he didn't sleep because my son is very sick so I will do it later he said no please go now and all of a sudden the doctor said I'm coming now and I said, okay, that's the plan of God. Maybe uh, I'm supposed to stay and, and, and listen to what, whatever they're going to tell me. I did that. Uh, I met that rad the radiologist, and he told me that, uh, Hasha, you don't have a blood clot. I said, oh, thank you. Thanks, God. I don't have that blood clot, alhamdulillah. I'm okay. I'm going to be fine. And he said, no, you're not going to be fine. This is a permanent thing. You have lymphedema. I said, what? What is lymphedema? What is this? Nobody knows what is an epidema. I'm a biologist and I've never heard. I know what's the lymph system and I know there are problems with the you know, lymph, but I didn't know what is the lymphedema. What is this? He said, Aisha, uh, when you were pregnant, when you have this preeclampsia things, uh, your body actually expands and your veins expand to the point that it was really hard to, uh, something got clogged in your lymph system. And it's really hard to do it because it's not like the, the veins. If it, if it was a blood vein, then it's really hard. It's, it's going to be easy to give you medication. But in the lymph uh, system is very delicate. And once it gets clogged, then it's really hard to, to, 
to fix it. So, am I gonna stay like that? What are you saying? Uh, am I? Is my leg gonna stay like that forever? And and he said, there is there is some maintenance thing that you have to do, but the the problem will stay like that forever. And it, it will get worse. But you have to take really good care of yourself. You have to take really good care of your leg. Or otherwise, you will uh, you will have big problems. You know, in order to digest all these things, it took me a while. You know, I went home. I started crying. I, I went like crazy. You know, the, googling about lipidema. What is this thing that? What is this disease that they're telling me about? It took me a while to accept it, to love it. As part of my body now, I have to love it, and I have to find out the best way to live with it. Um, I studied about it, I read about it. Immediately I joined, I, I, I knew that there is a, like a society for lymphedema patients in, uh, in uh, Canada and in uh, America. I joined both of them. And uh, I'm receiving uh, all the papers, the medical papers that, uh, that actually being published you now by all these uh, societies and um, I, I thought to myself uh, maybe I should start you know raising awareness about it so I came up with this uh, social account in the Instagram uh, that's called Lymphedema Arabia and I was you know translating uh, some of those papers that I uh, that I get in my email about lymphedema because I thought there must be people here with lymphedema in this part of the world who wants to know and I want to start loving my lymphedema to embrace it. I wouldn't say fight it. I cannot remove it. It's there. It's going to stay there forever. But I would love it. I would live with it. I will, I will try to come up with the best way of living with it. So I just, I know that it's not good for a lymphedema patient to get, you know, to gain weight. So I came up with this uh, kind of uh, nutrition uh, style, uh, a healthy lifestyle. I, I, I just came up with it. Uh, a hugely popular one <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Alternative sources of food for lymphedema patients. It is an amazingly popular site and uh, yes. strongly encouraged. Please follow yeah. it. I decided that if I just, um, if I want to uh, stay healthy, and if I want to keep on going on this healthy lifestyle, I have to love it. If I just uh, eat healthy food and the diet food and the stuff that I found on the grocery stores, then I will never continue. I will never commit, be committed to this uh, healthy lifestyle. So I had to come up with healthy lifestyle that, that is really tempting, that is really delicious, that I really enjoy doing and eating. So I came up with all these recipes, healthy recipes, and I posted on my Instagram account, which was, which until now it's Lymphedemia Arabia. Uh, many of my, uh, actually, my followers are celebrities now, alhamdulillah. I just sit with the problem, try to understand it, and then look at it like a blessing or something, and then just at that point, you will be able to live with it and make the best out of it. So not denial, not defensive retreat, no. not anger, not resentment, but acceptance. Acceptance. And then acceptance. you start moving towards seeing how I can yes. deal with it. Fantastic. What do you think are the factors that limit the success of women? And I'll give you some, uh, some uh, data here. Figures from around the world show that more women, in fact 52% women than men now enroll in tertiary education. In, in UAE, it is about 65% uh, of women who have completed tertiary education, mm -hmm. with about 70% who have completed, uh, you know, their graduation. So there's a lot of talented, qualified yeah. women out there. Now, however, there are only 24% women in, in, in senior levels, in the C-suite that we call it. And women CEOs in the world's largest public listed companies make up less than 5%. Why do you think there are enough, there are so many talented, educated, qualified women, but not enough women at the top of the 
organizations. To be honest, Jaya, I think uh, the, the environment, particularly here in, uh, in the Arab world, is a very demanding environment for, uh, for a lady. Like, if you are uh, a lady, then you are expected to be, to look good, to be a very good and devoted mother, very uh, loyal and uh, caring wife, and very successful in your work and committed to your work also. And why not earn some money also? You should be rich, maybe or try to earn your own money. So the environment, the, the society is demanding us to be like a super lady, super creature. While on the other hand, the man is not demanded to or requested to have all these things. If he is good in his work, or that's enough. People will not think, uh, will not ask behind him if he's a good father or not. He's not supposed to be there all the time. If like one of his kids uh, failed at school, probably they will uh, actually blame the mother. Mm. They will not blame him. Mm. But even if you're like on the top of the ladder and you're a very well-known lady, uh, and one of your kids is not doing well at school, then people will not also blame the father. They will be still blame you. Because you are the mother, you are supposed to do all these things. You are the wife, you are to be, you have to be a very good wife to your husband, you have to be a very good mother, you have to be a very good uh, employee uh, at your work. And simply they want the task that the woman uh, used to do, she's, it's still her heritage. She's taking it with her still to this century. Uh, people would uh, would love to see her go out maybe and um, earn some money and be uh, a, a society figure or something like that. But but still, they will not uh, take away her responsibility or her task, the old task that that she used to do. So you're saying that essentially while we are talking about organizations having to create a lot of structural changes and policy interventions, etc., change starts at the sociocultural assumptions level where women, it's, it's, the, the, you know, it's the care economy, uh, uh, it's a default yeah. setting for women that yeah. no matter how successful you are. The society is not still not ready uh, to share some of the family responsibilities with, with the man. They still think that the major share of the family responsibility should go to the lady. Mm. Even if she's working, even if she's providing for the family, even if she's you know, a very important person who's doing very major things in her society, they would not look at that and say, mm, uh, no, we will forgive her for not being maybe a, a very committed mother or devoted mother. No, they will not. How do you change that? How do you change this? Uh, you know, in America, I used to have friends, uh, like couples, who used, like, the, the lady will go out once a week for us, and then she would, her, you know, her husband would uh, be happily sitting down watching the kids for her and doing the dishes. I actually, when I went to Oklahoma, uh, the family that uh, I stayed with, uh, the man, the man was the one who, who will do the cooking. I, I, he, he's a lawyer. He's a lawyer, a very well-known lawyer in Oklahoma. And uh, she would stay and wait for him to come back from work and do the cooking. He would cook the dinner for us. And imagine that one coming from UAE and seeing that. <laughs> My heart aches. <laughs> I wish we had this kind of. So it is. It is perhaps the, the gendered binaries that you're talking about, and it, it goes by right to what your father said that yes. uh, do not think that you are a woman. I, even in that statement, yes. there is a belief that being a woman is somewhere subordinate to a man, and which is which is what the social cultural assumptions at that time was. And as these gendered binaries, I mean, you know, you're a woman, therefore this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're a man, therefore you are supposed to be the provider, yeah. the, you know, the main breadwinner. It somehow, it seeps in as we grow in our lives and that, that barrier, that, that binaries 
what you're saying is that should dissolve. Exactly. Isn't exactly. It? it shouldn't be uh, the man shouldn't be ashamed to do to help his wife in doing like uh, some of the house chores or something. It shouldn't be that way. And the man should not also keep all the responsibilities. I know some ladies who are very you know dedicated you know workers. They're very hard workers. Uh, they never miss the day uh, unless they really need it. And then they come back. They make the food, and then she also teach her kids. So that's a full-time job. She teaches her kids, and then uh, by the end of the day, she's really, really, uh, you know, tired. While her husband is working also, but he doesn't think that he has at least to help her in teaching the kids, doing with them their homework, or at least help her with any other chores. So, so I we think it's about time for men to know that. You know, if you want her also to provide for the family, uh, then you should help her with other chores. Is media, you think, also in some ways responsible for perpetuating these blue-pink conversations? Because if you look at an ad, I mean, I call it the blue-pink yeah, conversations, yeah. you know. It, well, that's right. If you look at an ad, you will see a young uh, mother cooking and, you know, keeping a spotless home. And even yeah. if she comes back, she is immediately rushing and making sure that everybody is taken care of and the guy is sitting and reading a newspaper or watching the television. Uh, you yes. see a lot of advertisements yes. like that. Yes. Yes. Now, we even in the songs. That's correct. Yeah. So some, some kids' songs, they're showing the family like that. The father must be reading the newspaper and the mother is the one who's it's cleaning really, and cooking. It's, it's, it's all. So, so yeah. these are, this is images that get kind of, you know, it becomes part of our unconscious assumptions. Yeah. So there is a need perhaps to make sure that our yes. media starts, you know, creating visuals which are changing these gender binaries in some way, isn't it? Yes, it's time. It's time. It's time and, and UAE is doing pretty well. I mean, UAE has got some great stories. 27.5% women in cabinet positions is perhaps at the top of the game. We're lucky in this country because the leadership is backing us up. That's right. They're on That's our right. side. So, alhamdulillah. <laughs> which is, which is, uh, which is, yes, absolutely. Now, when you're talking about organizational, so at one level we have to make sure that society, uh, families, the way children are brought up yeah. are not, you know, structured in gender binaries. At another level we are saying that media or, you know, the print, w whatever messages out there should be such that it should be changing. Schools perhaps, do you think schools have a responsibility? Again, do you see some differences? So if it's a really rough game, we say that, hey, this is for boys, the softer ones, uh, we try to protect women also in many ways because we don't want them to get hurt, young girls for example. Now that is also preventing them from developing the career capital that is necessary to succeed later on in life, to take risks, yes. to show leadership, to show perseverance. In your case, you said that I got the opportunities to take risks early on and that kind of has, you know, it, had, it, has, it has evolved over a period of time in what you have become. So, schools perhaps, do you think, should also start questioning the assumptions that they come in with when they are bringing up, to, you know, these opportunities for children? School is the other family, the other family of any child. So, it is really important that also uh, the people, the, the mind that is uh, uh, behind the blueprints of the curriculums yes. and uh, yes. uh, should be chosen very well. So we shouldn't just put the curriculum in the hands of those people who are coming from uh, old schools and who are still, you know, have this heritage of uh, women should do this, men should do that. Uh, we should, we should really uh, keep discovering what the potential of any child. It doesn't matter if he's a boy or a girl. Right? Let him just follow his heart and do whatever he can do. Now, uh, when we come to organizations, uh, uh, where do you think the accountability lies? If, if women are, of course, uh, child rearing and taking care of the family, taking care of aging parents, that's a reality. A lot of the burden does shift on women. So we often argue for flexi time arrangements. Now, the problem with flexi time arrangements is when I'm, it's usually women who opt yes. for flexi time. Uh, because of all that you mentioned earlier, but then they also miss out on a lot of opportunities for visibility or important meetings that they need to be part of or, or, or other things that are necessary for them to grow in their career. So even when they are taking flexi time, they are essentially 
going back about 5 years compared to a male colleague. So, how fair is it? So, so in a sense the data that is emerging mm -hmm. is that you might be having these interventions such as flexi time, but it is still working to the disadvantage of women because while they are taking these, they are relegated to the sidelines in part time positions, support functions and not really in the heart of the operational and strategic understanding that is necessary to move into higher level positions. So, how do you think organizations can support? What should they be doing? You know, Jaya, I think, I think we could, we could like uh, there is a, an Arabic proverb, you, uh, you hold the stick from the middle or <laughs> it means that you, you, can, you can balance things. Yeah. Yeah. You can balance things. Like uh, I, and me as an example, I wouldn't uh, miss a very important opportunity. Right. But, you know, I try, it's not about time that you spend with kids as much as it's the quality. Yeah. Maybe I'm, 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 uh, I'm not there in like 24 7 for my kids. Um, sometimes I have to travel yeah. and uh, I, I leave them with uh, sometimes, you know, some relatives. Uh, my husband is there. He's or something mm -hmm. so and uh, there's a trusted nanny alhamdulillah in the house but the time I make sure that the time that I spend with them is a quality time mm -hmm. I make sure that I don't miss things I think women could maybe work on this thing like uh, never lose an opportunity never try to um, uh, you know find for yourself excuses because, oh, you know, I have my kids. Well, your kids, they want you happy. Your kids want you to be successful. Your yeah. kids want the best, to be proud of their mom, the best mom that she can ever be. Yes. Well, what you're saying is, uh, let the, let, let, give autonomy to the woman to make a choice as to how she wants to spread her time so that exactly. she's still part of the deliverables and the strategic thinking that is necessary yes. for her to build her career. So women, you think, should start negotiating a little bit more assertively at work? Of course, I, but I still, I still go for the long uh, maternity leave. Yes, 45 that, days. Yeah. That time, the, the mother and the baby, they're both vulnerable yes. and they're, they need all the time. To the mother herself, he needs to recover. Imagine, nine months. Yes. Uh, is 45 days enough to recover from nine months of carrying this, you know, like, uh, you, you, there is a creation inside of you, the yes. creation. Yes, You have written something about it as well. Yes, I did wrote an article about it. Yes. Uh, and I compared the, the maternity leave in some, some of the countries, especially in the West. Yeah. The Nordic countries, for yeah, example. They, they would have up to, up to one year sometimes. So what you're saying is that there has to be some legislative changes. Yes, and there are many organizations here that have, uh, despite the law, they have started introducing more time for women I'm to sure take them off. I'm sure that soon, soon, Jaya, we yeah. will hear, uh, inshallah, good, uh, good announcement about uh, a change, a big change in the uh, maternity leave because yes. um, this country is always looking for the best and the the things that makes the people happy. So why not? Mr. Always ask yourself, why not? You can do it and nobody is going to come and help you. You are the one who could save yourself, save your soul. Nobody is going to give you a hand sometimes. Don't expect the others. The more you expect from others, the more disappointed you will be. So just don't wait for somebody to come and grab you and take you out from, you know, whatever the trap that you are in. Nobody's going to do that. You have to make that decision for yourself. Save yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. <laughs>